Uh, good morning, and uh, good. Uh, thank you for all being here today. And I want to recognize we're joining you from the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, including the Songhees and Esquimalt Nation. And I'm apologizing up front for my voice. It uh, decided to worst day to lose your voice, but here it is. So bear with me. Um, joining me today for our, our announcement is Minister Josie Osborne, who's leading the uh, BC's newest ministry of land, water, and resource stewardship. Also, we have Carl Archie, the Government Transition Advisor, and Councillor Stanley Daniels from the Cannon Lake Band, who are here on behalf of Chief Helen Henderson. And Gary Merkel's with us, a respected forester who co authored the Old Growth Strategic Review and was a member of the Old Growth to Technical Advisory Panel. Gary is continuing to advise the Ministry of Forests on the implementation of the recommendations from the Strategic Review. It's wonderful to have you all here with me today. Um, our government is taking a new vision in forestry that is focused on taking better care of BC's rarest and most ancient forests, ensuring Indigenous peoples are full partners in how forests are managed on their territory, and providing communities and workers benefits that with well-paying and innovative jobs for generations to come. Our forests are a cherished part of who we are as British Columbians, and we know that some forests are irreplaceable and need special care. That's why we are acting to implement the recommendations of the Old Growth Strategic Review. Logging deferrals are a temporary measure to prevent irreversible loss while we develop a new long-term approach to old growth management that prioritizes ecosystem health and community resiliency. We know that the first step to better caring for our forests is working in partnership with First Nations and putting Indigenous peoples at the center of land management decisions in their territories. Since November, Government has been engaging directly with First Nations rights and title holders on how they want to proceed on old growth deferrals in their territories. It's important that we took the time to get this right and not make decisions unilaterally. I'm really pleased to report out on the progress we have made thanks to this hard work. Logging deferrals have now been implemented on nearly 1.7 million hectares of old growth. To give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about, this area is equal in size to 4,100 Stanley Parks. And it is more old growth than is currently protected in the Great Bear Rainforest. These deferrals announced today are in addition to the nearly 200,000 hectares of old growth that our government has already deferred since September 2020. And this includes the Ferry Creek watershed and central Walbran area that we deferred last June with, at the request of the Pachidat, the Dididat, and the Hawaiian First Nations. And they mean we've made real progress on preventing the logging of forests at high risk of biodiversity loss, as recommended by the Old Growth Strategic Review. In total, over 80% of the most at-risk old growth in BC identified last fall by the Old Growth Technical Advisory Panel is not currently threatened by logging, either because it is already protected, covered by deferrals, or too uneconomic to harvest. And I want to note that we are continuing to engage with First Nations on old growth deferrals. And while we receive responses from 188 of the 204 First Nations in BC, many requests have been made to, that require more time before decisions are made. And this includes taking time that they need to incorporate local knowledge and Indigenous values on the areas proposed for deferral. So the public can be reassured that we're on the right track. Even before these new deferrals, old growth logging has increased by 40% over the past five years. As a result, in 2020, less than 0.3% of the 11.1 .1 million hectares of old growth in BC were logged. Forestry is a foundation of the BC economy and good jobs that support families and communities right across our province. And while we move forward with deferrals, we are also ensuring that no one is left behind as we transition to a new, more sustainable approach to managing BC's forests. And this was a key recommendation in the Old Growth Strategic Review. Budget 2022 commits an additional $185 million over three years to provide coordinated and comprehensive supports for forestry workers and rural communities impacted by old growth deferrals. This includes up to providing forestry contractors with short-term employment opportunities, connecting workers with skills training and education, helping older workers bridge to retirement to help open up jobs for younger workers,
support rural economic diversification and infrastructure projects, and deliver on the ground economic development and community support services. We will also be striking a forest, Forestry Worker Supports and Community Resilience Council to advise the government on the design and implementation of these programs. The Council will be made up of industry, labour, Indigenous and municipal leaders and will help ensure that programs are targeted and providing supports where they are needed most. And this Council will be led by my new Parliamentary Secretary, Doug Routley. Finally, we will be doubling our efforts to support innovation and transforming the forestry industry from a focus on high volume to high value. And this will mean more made in BC manufacturing and more jobs created per tree harvested. We are currently engaging with industry on reforms, reforms to BC timber sales to better support the growth of BC's value added industry. And I look forward to providing more details on these in the months to come. By working together, we can better care for our rarest and most ancient forests and realize a new vision for forestry in BC that supports healthy ecosystems and healthy communities. And I'm looking forward to hearing from all our speakers today and I'm going to start by turning it over to Minister Osborne. Thank you. Thanks so much, Minister Conroy, and thanks to everybody for joining us here today. I'm very grateful to be here with Gary Merkel and with councillors Stanley Daniels and Carl Archie from the Canham Lake Indian Band. It's incredibly important to hear their perspectives as we move forward on a new approach to managing BC's old growth forests. I was very honoured and humbled to be appointed by Premier Horgan as the Minister of Land, Water and Resource Stewardship and Minister Responsible for Fisheries. This new ministry will support government's goals of economic prosperity, environmental sustainability and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Working with Indigenous governments and organizations will develop a new vision and new policies for resource management that embrace shared decision making on the land base, bringing BC's natural resource policy framework in line with the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. As part of this work, we will be supporting Minister Conroy and the Forest Ministry in the implementation of all 14 recommendations in the Old Growth Strategic Review. And that support will flow from my ministry's mandate of advancing reconciliation, prioritizing ecosystem health and biodiversity, and building opportunities on the land base and in our marine environments that, for communities to thrive. For example, in supporting the implementation of the old growth strategy, we will ensure that it is woven into larger land use planning objectives and governance structures. And as Minister Conroy noted, old growth deferrals are a temporary measure to prevent irreversible biodiversity loss while we develop this new long term approach to sustainable forest management. The deferrals provide us with the time and the space that we need to work with, in partnership with First Nations, with communities, with industry, with workers and other stakeholders to make sure we get this right. This new approach recognizes that a shift to prioritize ecosystem health is critical if forests are to continue to provide essential benefits for British Columbians. Benefits like clean water, clean air, carbon storage, the conservation of biodiversity and timber. Realizing this vision is going to require collaboration, integrated planning and new governance structures and it requires us to walk a path in partnership with Indigenous communities and peoples on the road to reconciliation through shared decision making. This is work that will culminate in a new old growth strategy for BC to be completed in 2023. So I'm very much looking forward to working together with Minister Conroy and all of our partners in this very, very important work. And I would now like to introduce Councillors Stanley Daniels and Carl Archie to speak. Thank you. Wait who quiet up. Carl Archie and Squogst, please sound Squogst. The Chaskan the Swamok does the Aquan, was the Alkstone with Gwenmi Ibla Tenui. Gox Jacham Hui were as Guimalt at Songhees the Swax, were tempt mukes. Latin Boosman as weeks for quite up in Alien of Blue Den. Hello everyone, my name is Carl Archie. I am from the Catholic Band of the Squamok Nation. I'm an elected councillor. I want to thank the Songhees and the Squamalt Nations for allowing me 
to be on this territory uninvited and for hosting the colonial government. I'm glad to see everyone here today. For those that don't know, the Kamalik Band is located in the interior of British Columbia in what is today known as the Caribou Region. It's ironic that the region is named after caribou, the animal that we call Selhuaychen in our language. Historically, the people of what is now Kanamlik Band relied mostly on caribou as one of our main food sources. There were vast herds and the Kanamlik people protected these herds with our blood and lives. Though they once sustained our people from time immemorial, they now are extirpated. Where there were vast herds numbering in the thousands as far as the eye could see, they now hover near 100 animals in the Wells Gray Park. The decline is largely blamed on habitat loss from logging, taking with them our way of life and our cultural knowledge. The Kanalik Band has never sat back and played victim, however. More than a decade ago, we identified what we call our key interest area, an area of land over which we have requested an area-based force tenure over, and over which we evicted big industry and asserted our stewardship, our sole stewardship responsibility. We have also developed our own forest stewardship plan, which we call our SNINA Forest Stewardship Plan. This stewardship plan was approved by the province in 2022 and is unique in the province in that it reflects our Cannon Lake interests and priorities. We have also doubled our forestry team in recent years. We applaud the recent changes by, made by Minister Conroy at the Minister of Forests, including the modern, modernizing forest policy, legislative changes to the Forest Act, and the Forest Range Practices Act, and the Old Growth Deferral Initiative. <clears throat> Over the years, we have advocated hard to ensure that our voice was heard and that forest governance in this province better reflects our values. Many of our proposals are reflected in the proposed changes. We are proud that through these changes, First Nations in this province will have a greater share of the annual allowable cut and that we led this charge. We are happy to see that statutory decision makers must now consider whether or not an Indigenous government provided its free, prior and informed consent in making their decisions from the local level all the way up to the Minister and Chief Forester. We are also glad that landscape level land use planning with Indigenous governments will now be a requirement. It's badly needed to properly consider cumulative impacts in our territory. We have also accepted the old growth deferrals as proposed by the province. However, we have reserved the right to review each defer deferral on a case-by-case -case basis, inserting our inherent jurisdiction, including the right to provide or withdraw consent. We have also begun doing caribou habitat recruitment research, buoyed by a renewed hope with these deferrals. Our caribou rely on old growth forests for their very existence, and it's our responsibility to bring them back. Finally, with, this, with these changes, our forests will no longer be held hostage by multinational corporations who siphon wealth from British Columbia and have reinvested more than $6 billion outside of our province, who invest the least in our communities, who maximize the cut from our territories, and who create the least jobs. We believe in local ownership, local benefits, and local jobs, and local management of our forests. Although they are not perfect, stumpage is still discriminatory, and we're still waiting on our apportionment decision we believe that these proposed changes will bring us a step closer to our vision of healthy forests, clean water, rehabilitated wildlife and fauna, and a vibrant, sustainable economy. They represent some of the first changes in the province to align provincial laws with UNDRIP. I call upon First Nations across the province to pick up these tools to bring about beneficial change to your regions. These changes bring hope that our caribou can one day be recovered that First Nations can be full partners in our economies, and that the voices of our people are finally being heard. Gukstechemk, thank you, Minister Conroy, for your hard work and fearless leadership. Together we can change the world. Borokhan Matwikjen, and I'd also like to invite our next speaker, Gary Merkel. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, uh, in my language, Teltan, that means um, it, literal translation would be day good, but it, like many of our languages, it can mean many things. And for me, it means 
today is a new day to a new future, and it can be used in that context. I think today I, I was going to start just a little bit with um, a cultural view from my own community about how we see land, uh, and we have a view as many Indigenous people have, that we do not own land. It owns us. And we must take care of it or it will punish you. And the punishment is severe. And we have a law where I come from called Kuagon. It's a peacemaking law that teaches us how to maintain harmonious relationships amongst each other. We don't have the luxury in historical times of the option of going to a grocery store if we make mistakes. So if you don't look after the land or you don't work together, you feel those consequences very immediately. This thinking and carries a huge responsibility that in my own heart is inherent. It means that when I was born, it's part of who I am from the day I'm born. It creates and forms who I am as a person. It's not some altruistic, idealistic whatever. It's just what I am. This view is shared by most Indigenous people in this province um, as, a, as just a simple matter of survival, but we all need our spiritual roots. And so there was a whole bunch of discussion in the beginning when the deferrals were announced about do we need Indigenous approval or not? And frankly, from my perspective, I think it was a really smart move. We see many new models of land stewardship emerging from the Indigenous community that are grounded in that way of thinking that I just spoke about that have so much to teach us as land stewards in this province and frankly in the world. And this partnership, from my perspective, will yield nothing but positive benefits for all of us on so many dimensions. But again, uh, when Al Gorley and I uh, wrote The Old Growth, one of the fundamental assumptions that we had when we wrote that document was that this is, this is a transformative change that requires collective wisdom and collective ownership. You cannot impose this kind of societal change. People need to believe it, they need to feel it, and they need to feel like they want to work towards it. And our impression was that everybody was committed to this. And in fact, that's what everybody from every sector told us. We needed to change, and this is how we understood. They said we needed to change. We, and so I'm really, happy right now about since the deferrals came out because there was a lot of pushing and shoving at the start but m many have come to the idea that we all need to work together and we need to embrace this notion of an improved land stewardship in this province and they have committed to working towards that we still have a few hangers on who are kind of stuck in their own fears and their own insecurities or whatever but it reminds me a lot of a friend of mine, a, an author, Chris Mazur. He has a saying, there are no enemies out there. There are only frightened people. And this is a scary and transformative change. It requires a new way of thinking. It requires a new paradigm. But it also involves us unearthing and addressing our deep timber bias in British Columbia. And I'm not criticizing that. That was the foundation of this province. It's like Alberta with its oil and gas bias. It's, it's, it permeates everything. It's a lot like systemic racism towards the Indigenous community. It's in every policy. It's in every law. It's everywhere. And so, but one of the things about this, this paradigm is, like I said, it's a new paradigm on land, but it's a new paradigm on relationships. We're so used to being enemies in this, in this kind of whole land area that we don't really know any other way of behaving with each other. And, and the thing about that is, is we, we have learned to be very critical, but that kind of critical behavior makes others scared and defensive and hesitant to take the kind of necessary action that needs to be taken. I'm grateful that this government has conquered that fear and is willing to take this leap. 
And, uh, and so I, in part of my role, I talk to other countries about who've gone through similar shifts in thinking and in management and, uh, and just trying to learn from them so we can learn something about what we're doing. And I ask every one of them from every sector when I talk to them, would you ever go back to where you were? Unanimously, never. We are so glad we are here now. So I think just a couple closings. This is a transformative change. It takes patience. It takes tolerance. It takes us all helping each other to grow and to learn. And we obviously need to create new ways of doing this. And we are in the world. We are amongst the leaders in force management. And yes, we have some things that we're, we're going to have to fix. But we're doing lots of things really, really well. And we are seen and known for that. And frankly, from my perspective, it's really just a matter of bringing those good things forward and making them the way we do everything. And, uh, and we already know how to do this. So I'm excited about this. I'm uh, looking forward to the future. And thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. We're now ready to take questions. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question today comes from Chad Pawson, CBC. Uh, thanks everyone for this uh, conference and taking our questions. Uh, Minister Conroy talked about the transition money announced in the budget, the 100, uh, 85 million. Uh, can you talk when some of that programming is actually going to be put in place on the ground where workers can be seeing some of uh, that programming? Well, we've already actually started with some of the programming. The, for instance, the um, Bridging to Retirement for Older Workers. It was a program we brought in in 2019 and it was oversubscribed actually when there was a downturn in the forest industry. And so we've, we've brought that program back in and we had $19 million from in last year's budget to uh, uh, help people to bridge to retirement and it is, it's working again. Um, there are people that do want to bridge to retirement and leave uh, supports op uh, jobs open for younger workers. We've also um, are going to be providing jobs through the forest employment program. Um, we're going to be connecting uh, workers to skills training and education opportunities. Um, and we're doing this, um, this isn't just our ministry doing this, we're doing this in collaboration with um, the Ministry of Advanced Education and, and Skills Training and uh, Ministry of Labor and, is, and Jerry as well with Minister Kalon. So every, this is a full-on um, approach from all of government. It's not just from our ministry. And of course, now we have uh, Minister Osborne helping from the new ministry. We're also looking at funding for uh, rural economic diversification and infrastructure projects, um, supporting industry innovation in the forestry sector. Um, we are looking at uh, ways that we can support companies to move towards that value added um, as opposed to volume. And uh, we're also bringing in the uh, community teams to provide support on the grounds for communities who are going to be affected by these deferrals because I, I mean I'm I think I've been pretty clear that we know that uh, some communities will be affected and we want people to know that we are there for them we have support for them and we will be there to support workers and communities Chad do you have a follow-up yes please um, okay so if I, I'm just quickly looking at the numbers here from the release so I think we reported at the beginning of the month that it was around 624,000 hectares of the most old growth had been confirmed for deferral. Uh, now you're up to 1.05 million. So there's still another million to go uh, from what I understand of the numbers. So you can correct me if I'm wrong. So the question is, how are you going to get there within the 36 month timeline? And then also if you can address what you're going to do when the 36 months is up and those initial deferrals, you know, are starting to time out. So we're already working with, uh, with nations on, on those uh, initial two year deferrals. Cause some of them, we uh, did some deferrals back in 2020 and those deferrals will be coming up for potential renewal this um, August. So we're already in, uh, starting those engagements with nations. Um, the actual numbers, um, so of the unprotected, uh, like of the, the, the technical advisory panel that identified 4 million hectares 
of old growth that were at risk for irreversible biodiversity loss. Um, of that, 1.4 million hectares was already protected. And so that left 2.6 million um, that was unprotected. Um, currently, we deferred 1.05 million hectares. There is also 780,000 hectares of old growth that is uneconomical to harvest. It'll never be harvested. It's just, just it would be too costly. And totally, the, the, so that brings it up to 3.24 million hectares. So 81% of the uh, uh, old growth in the province is currently not threatened by harvesting in this province. So just so, uh, so the total deferred is 1.87 million. Our next question comes from Brenna Owen, Canadian Press. Thank you uh, for taking my question. Um, I'm just wondering, Minister, if you could, well, first of all, actually, I'm wondering if there will be a map released or perhaps there already is of the deferral areas. There have been a few announcements of like deferrals coming from particular nations. And I'm just wondering if that is going to be centrally um, accessible in some way. We are working, <coughs> excuse me, with the First Nations that have um, that we are working on the deferrals with, and if the First Nations are comfortable with uh, announcing their uh, uh, intention to defer, we are going to be doing that. We are uh, ensuring that uh, they are comfortable with it before um, we do that announcement. And there are some nations who have already made those announcements. The Hawaii, for instance, the Nanawakalis, they have come forward, and, and of course we have Canham Lake with us today. So um, we are working with the nations. Brenna, do you have a follow-up? Sure. Um, so I know that forestry companies could like voluntarily participate in the deferral process, and then also it could be done through the legal mechanism in the Forestry Act through the amendments last fall. So I'm wondering if you could give me a sense of what for like what the response in general, I, I realize it's different in every the case of every deferral, but what's the kind of general response, or maybe you could tell me, tell us a little bit about what the companies have been saying and doing. Well, the majority of the companies have uh, voluntarily agreed to defer. Um, so we are just looking at the um, at whether we need to introduce what it's called as Part 13 um, to bring in the, the legal uh, process for deferring. But um, companies have, that we've been talking to have actually reached out to nations. Um, some that haven't done deferrals yet, but the companies are reaching out. They recognize that since the work that was done by um, Gary and Al with the strategic review, that this was the way that things were, were changing. Um, as Gary says all the time, it's a paradigm shift in the forest industry and, and in how we uh, take care of our forests. And so companies have already been reaching out to nations and, and doing that work. Our next question today comes from Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Hi, Lisa, are you there? A little bit. Yes, yes, I am. Hello? Please go ahead. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, this, right. I'd like to ask Carl Archie a little bit, if you could tell us a little more detail about the forest stewardship plan. Um, does this plan include, and can you tell us how much, you know, of the deferrals that were announced last November you have sort of finalize what, uh, how much land is involved there, and whether this forest stewardship plan means that you will be working with uh, forest companies in the future, or do you have your own forest company that will be, um, you know, harvesting? Can you, can you kind of put some flesh on the bones about that? Yeah, so the Canham Lake Band's forest stewardship plan is available on our website, www.canamlakeband.com. It's, we have two different forest stewardship plans. One of them is an official forest stewardship plan that manages our tenure. Uh, the other one is the Sinina forest stewardship plan, which is a forest stewardship plan that we apply generally to our territory. We do work with companies on, on a case-by-case -case basis when we receive referrals um, for uh, harvesting in our territory. And we review um, with the companies uh, whether or not uh, their plans meet uh, our requirements that are outlined in the forest stewardship plan. And so we've, are, we've been uh, asserting this uh, jurisdiction for quite some time now. And uh, we also work with the companies on, on the old growth deferrals. Uh, we've gone through a number of exercises with them. We've also outlined in our, our letter to the minister some criteria for um, 
the old growth deferrals. Some of them include our for criteria for companies who want to remove a particular deferral. Uh, some of those include uh, things like forest health, old growth beetle management, or beetle management, or just gross errors in the data. And so we've asked the companies that if they want to have those deferrals removed, then it's their responsibility to do the work and then come to us and prove why those uh, deferrals should be removed. Otherwise, they will remain in place. Does that answer your question? That's wonderful. Thank you, Carl. Yes. Uh, do you have a follow-up, Lisa? Yes. Thank you, Carl. That did answer a lot of my question. And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how, I think it was in, in 2011 that the, the Canon Lake Band signed um, uh, like a revenue sharing agreement with the province. How much different is it for your people today when it comes to uh, the management of forests and how uh, revenue sharing agreements are uh, affected by by your uh, your new forest stewardship plan? Yeah, so we signed um, what's referred to as an F cursa, or I'm not sure what the acronym stands for. There's too many of them, but. Um, the Canada Lake Band does receive uh, significant revenue as a result of that agreement. Uh, we were able to put those, that revenue into programs, uh, invest, reinvest it back into our businesses, and ensure that our people uh, have better quality services provided to them. Uh, the Forest Stewardship Plan is something separate, so that's a management plan that has uh, little to do with the revenue that we receive. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, First Nations Woodlot licenses uh, have what we consider to be discriminatory stumpage relative to community forests. And so we pay a significantly higher rate for our stumpage uh, compared to a community forest. And so uh, we do receive that revenue back as part of the FCURSA agreement. Um, however, it does uh, change the way that we manage our tenure. And so rather than logging to the forest management plan, we often pick our logging, our, the timing of our logging to coincide with whether or not the um, stumpage is high or low. And so it has a significant effect on us, um, although we do receive the revenue. Thank you. And for our final question today, we go to Les Lane, Times Colonist. Well, thanks very much. I'd like to ask Mr. Merkel, um, just scanning the news release accompanying this and listening to your remarks, the word temporary is kind of fading away a bit. And I've, I wondered from the start, um, how, do you foresee any of these temporary deferrals uh, being abandoned? Or uh, it's, it, I, I'm having a hard time picturing these deferrals becoming anything other than permanent, except for maybe a few fragments here and there. That's, uh, that's a question, the million-dollar question that everybody asks. Um, um, it will depend. Um, without going a ton into the technical detail on how to plan for ecological integrity and ecosystem health, um, it is possible to do things even in rare, endangered uh, ecosystems uh, that continue to maintain ecological integrity on the landscape it is possible to use systems that are more attuned to and friendly to the type of ecosystem that they come from. And so each area will be a little bit different. Um, it may be um, in some areas we do have to think about ecosystem restoration and how do we actually um, recreate an ecosystem pattern across the landscape. Um, and it may be that part of that plan is is deferring some of these even a little longer. Uh, I don't. I can't answer that as a blanket answer because it really is a local planning exercise. But the short answer is uh, no. It's not a wholesale withdrawal. And the short answer on the other side is it is possible that some of them may have to be deferred for longer just to fit into the ecosystem restoration and, uh, and maintaining ecosystem integrity plans that are built on a local basis. Les, do you have a follow-up? 
The announcement in November, uh, just to make sure I've got the right context, it was to temporarily defer 2.6 million hectares. Today it's 1.7. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the basically the context we're talking about. It, are, are you folks generally happy with that? That's what, give or take two thirds of what you were looking for in a fairly short period of time. Is, is, is this going along smoothly or um, is that number is that threshold not been met? I'll answer from my perspective of having the honor and opportunity to work with all the different sectors and speak to them about how we're doing on this and how we need to realign things to make them work better, et cetera, et cetera. As uh, Minister Conroy said, there's very few companies who are uh, who are not respecting these deferrals now, and I, I don't know of any that I have met. I'm not saying there isn't because we have so many forest companies in this province, but certainly the majors that I work with and all of the folks in Kofi understand that we do need to make this shift uh, as long as we can figure out a way to work around uh, these things. So. Yeah, this, I guess the answer is there is a whole bunch in the tube still uh, that we are working through with local First Nations. This is a complex analysis, um, as Carl indicated, and you need to work through it. It's not just a simple yes or no answer if you take your stewardship responsibility um, seriously. So, and we have a number of existing forums between local First Nations governments and the province and that where these are going and there's technical analyses and everything going on. The principle, I haven't had one First Nation yet that I've talked to who doesn't disagree with the principle. There has been a couple who've said we've already got a plan to do exactly what you're doing and we're going to follow our plan, but I have not had one that I know of yet who said this principle is wrong. So. I'm not unhappy. I, I, that was the question. Sorry, I rambled a bit, but I no, I'm not unhappy at all. I think this is a monumental task, and we're making incredible progress compared to what I was a little worried we would do. Yes, I'm just going to add to that. Uh, we're not unhappy either. When you consider there's 204 nations, rights and title holders, that we reached out to, um, there's been seven who have said no to the deferrals because they already are doing deferrals in their traditional territory. There was um, five nations who um, we haven't been able to get a hold of yet because of COVID, um, wildfires and floods. Um, so we're still, and we're working with the rest that, that we haven't uh, finalized uh, agreements with. But to think that we've uh, gotten a hold of and worked with so many nations in such a short period of time is pretty incredible. And, and I just want to give credit to the staff and to the nations who have been working on, on these uh, um, deferrals and, and on these agreements. Because it, 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 it is, it's been a lot of work, but it's, it's, um, it's coming to fruition. And, and there's a lot more work left to do, but we're, gonna, we're all committed to doing it. Thank you very much, everyone. That concludes today's event.